Dave Perry, man. Finally. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. I've I've been doing, um, you know, Shauna got us connected and I've been doing, she's been crushing it. And I've been doing a lot of press recently, but I got to admit that I've been looking forward to talking to you for a while um, as a, I'm a fan of your show and your approach. And I also have a theory that we are on parallel paths or that we have a similar approach to like achieving, doing what we love without the support of some sort of like top tier apparatus yeah. that's doing it you know like for me it would be a record label for you it would be some sort of like you know <clears throat> digital network that like a journalism organization or something like that and right. while that can be um discouraging overwhelming whatever like you have clearly put in a lot of time and effort blood sweat and tears to like create a brand for yourself grassroots stuff pull yourself up by the bootstraps all that kind of stuff to get the type of caliber of people that you have on your show is i think strongly reflects a combination of um just your like acumen for what you're doing but it also speaks volumes to like you as a person and obviously like people wouldn't want to keep coming on your show if you sucked at what you did <laughs> or, like <laughs> weren't enjoyable to talk to and i just actually was i was just revisiting um two of your episodes with clint and I was really digging the oh, one where yeah. where Paul is in the beginning of the episode. And I feel like he <laughs> summarized what he loves about you. And I think other people love about you is that it's very clear that like you come off as a fan in the same way that like Matt Pinfield comes off as a fan. Like, you know, he's he's a genius. But like, um, I think it's very clear when someone's approaching a conversation from like a journalistic standpoint and and then when someone is like you can have journalistic <clears throat> intentions and use journalistic tools but still be speaking from a more passionate place of like this music means so much to me so connecting with the people who make that music who have already personally impacted to me i just think that comes off uh, wow. crystal clear you. in your interview style so I, I i really enjoy that and i've been looking forward to talking to you oh wow man dude i feel like you're interviewing me that that was that was great <laughs> <laughs> thank you I have a tendency yeah. of doing that, so feel free to tell me to shut up if I. No, no, I love it. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it, and I love when you brought up Clint because I haven't watched those interviews in so long, and they're so yep. hard to watch for me. Do you do you have um, when you put out music? Can you go back and listen to it, or do you go critique yourself like I do? Like I can't I will, just enjoy my interviews. Not sure, at all. I will. I will admit that, and you know, this is something. I think Clint is great as this as well. I'm going to reference Clint a lot during this I conversation. Love, look at this, you know, man. This I know. I, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I think Clint does an amazing job of walking that line of he's obviously very serious about his commitment to his artistry and about the business of being a professional musician, especially for like three decades. And this is how he feeds his family. Like in all of those regards, he takes it very seriously. But he yeah. also doesn't take himself too seriously as an artist and i think that's very clear in his social content in his stage presence when he does like walk in the streets at night whatever but he can also yeah, yeah. do stuff that like is gut-wrenching heart-wrenching soul-crushing level of intimacy and vulnerability and you know i aspire to walk that line as well so to, but to answer your question um not only am i big my my biggest critic but like i, I will admit and and this is just part of like having this level of vulnerability and really not caring about how other people perceive it, which is really even just like what the name fear of water is about, is about like being true to yourself. You know, the human body is composed of like 70, 80% of water. And I've just always been so inspired by this resistance in Western culture to, um, you know, you can acknowledge what's mainstream and what's popular and what's accepted and what's comfortable. That's fine. But to feel compelled that you need to adhere to that, to be accepted. And especially if you feel like your true inner self is polar opposite of that, then you like repress that and push that down. Unfortunately, I think way too many people, <clears throat> especially in our generation, um, fall prey to that. And it's, I, mm. it's like a constant reminder to me to not do that. So one of those things is that I'll admit that Pretty much every year for like the last six years when i get my spotify wrapped my top artist is me like i listen <laughs> to my own music that's great constantly part of it is because my goal if a song i a, a, one of my songs will never see the light of day if it's not something that i love and obviously i am biased um but also i am my biggest critic so there's tons of stuff that will never see the light of day because i hate a variety of different aspects about it but like you know it's it's 
I miss, I think what you were alluding to not watching those episodes in a while is that you feel like you have evolved since then obviously your production oh, yeah, studio absolutely. and, and quality so like um i encourage you to not do that if, if if for no other reason it helps you keep perspective it helps you appreciate the evolution it helps you appreciate the conversation we're having right now to see what you were doing in 2020 and you're still pulling guests like clint lowry in 2020 so like i if for no other reason and and similar for me on a parallel path what i was doing in like 2019 is recording at home i wasn't in i wasn't going to nashville i wasn't working with multiple producers that were doing number one songs and working with tons of artists that i respect i wasn't collaborating with clint lowry and elias soriano and heidi shepherd from butcher babies and aaron nordstrom from uh gemini syndrome um but i never want to lose sight of the fact that i i, I was just a guy making internet videos and that just remembering all of the gas that went into that tank, all the different things that inspired me and influenced me to keep taking these progressive steps of like, okay, I want to elevate, um, elevate to the next level. And I want to continue to evolve. I'm going to invest more in this. I'm going to get this piece of gear. I'm going to try this musical style. I'm going to cover this song, even though I, you know, I'm intimidated by it. Like, um, I think you should go back and watch those episodes, yeah. man. I think there's well, something even, to be learned. Thank you. Good Lord. I'm going to do it now or, or after this. Yeah, interview. Let's, stop. let's stop right now and watch it together. <laughs> it pause. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just comes up on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mention all these great people you've collaborated with. Yeah. You know, where does that begin? Where, where is that where you, you have fear of water and you're like, Hey, I'm just going to, you know, connect with all the people I love, you know, but like yeah. all the people we love, me and you love the same people, but yeah, for I mean, sure. There's a lot of crossover that, there. How, how does that start? Where, who's the first person that you got that was big? Um, know? so the first so where it starts from is just when I'm there are several of these songs that I've written that when I'm writing them, and this is just like pie in the sky. I knew none of these people. I had no connection to them before I made contact with them and got them on board. Um, and so there was a lot of cold calling there. There's some scenarios where someone vouched for me and got us connected, but at the end of the day, you know, the music has really had to stand on its own. Like all of these artists at the end of the day need to be like, do I want my name attached to not only this song, but this person who I really don't know anything about, um, you know, for the rest of my career. Yeah. I, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't yeah, I would never blame an artist for deciding no <clears throat> in that scenario. Obviously anyone who's at a Clint Lowry level or Elias Soriano, people have been doing this for, for almost three decades. People who have gone from, the, the height of the music industry when it was the most profitable thing, you know, late eighties, early nineties, and then survived the complete destruction of the music industry with the introduction of Napster and have evolved into what it is today. I, those, you needed to be meticulous and strategic and methodical. So I would never blame someone for, if I reached out to them and be like, Hey man, you don't know me. I'm just a very passionate guy who can play a bunch of instruments. If you want to <laughs> do something with me, I would never blame someone for being like, this doesn't work with my, plan my strategy yeah. like i don't i don't know you like if if it's not something that elevates them as like there's a v wide variety of reasons why i would understand why someone wouldn't work with me but what's great is that uh now i have like five of these collaborations under my belt and not just the fact that they exist but like codependent parasites with elias soriano of nonpoint <clears throat> did incredibly great well song. as Thank you so much. I appreciate Sorry. that. And like I as that, i was though. writing it back to your question like how does it start i literally was just writing and be like man Elias would sound fucking sweet on it. Like that, that was it. Not like I got a lead here and I'm going to follow this. It was just like, there was something about the, <clears throat> the, it doesn't even necessarily sound like a non-point song, but there was something about the percussive syncopation of the vocals in the verse where I was like, I sound okay doing this. Elias would fucking slay this. And I've, you know, I grew up in Madison, outside of Madison, Wisconsin. Non-point has like a deep deep seated love for that town like they will come play uh jjo 94.1 is the uh, radio station there they were one of the first bands to really give statement uh, a fair shot and why is that why is that why? so uh, i don't i don't like why was it jj why was it that radio station and not yeah other why radio stations? it was constant like why is it why where's the love from the, i don't know if you know i don't that, know be, because there, i i actually don't have a whole lot of good things to say about wisconsin as a <laughs> as a as a, like an epicenter of like musical culture there's no there like I, there's a very short list of bands that have come out of wisconsin um there's really not a lot of great venues and the, honestly there's really not a lot of great radio stations there's a very few like it's a very red state it's a not, not that it's not a political thing but just it's very rural hmm. uh there's a lot of country fans there's a lot of you know pop and hip-hop has been dominating the entire country if not the world for a very long time and it's just like 
and during that time period, um, you know, we, in a 10 year period period, we went from corn regularly being the number one band on TRL to TRL doesn't exist anymore <laughs> and no one's buying CDs. And like, I just feel like there was a ton of stations that were switching formats. Um, just what was cool and acceptable was just no longer leaning towards rock. And it's just all the, like a lot of the rock festivals were going away and it was, it was depressing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really cool to see bands like Nonpoint and Seven Dust not only push through that time period, but they're, they're kind of at the top of their game still uh, and doing incredible things. Um, I just think that there was good. I'm, I'm, I don't know who, but like, I really think it came down to like some individuals within JJO who just mm -hmm. heard the potential in that band. And I do not think it's something that is reflective of like the culture <laughs> of Wisconsin. Um, but that being said, they have built an enormous fan base in Madison and they can go anytime that they come there, they are going to sell out whatever show that they're playing or whatever. So I've, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to see nonpoint 40 times, something yeah, like that. Same here, dude. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I love them. That. And fortunately, like the nonpoint and seven dust path has been very parallel. Like I've seen them play together. They were, were releasing music around the same time. They are similar genre, but very distinct in their own ways. And yeah, so, uh, you know, I've, I've very briefly interacted with, with Elias through like, you know, meet and greets or like talk to him for two minutes on ship rocked here and there. But like, I would never expect him to remember who I am. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate to have the channels to get this song that I created with Kyle O'Dell uh, out of Nashville. Um, basically, I went down there in 2022, 2023. That's what it was um, with a batch of songs and, you know, that I wrote at home and recorded at home. And it's like, I want you to like turn this into polished awesomeness that can be like octane ready because I'm not capable of doing that at home. And like I said, at the end of the day, he didn't know me from any other fan. And it just really came down to like, do you like the song? Like, do, can you envision your voice being on the song? Do you want your name and your brand associated with this? And not only did he do the song, but he's, I mean, I consider him a friend now. Like we talk on a regular basis. He's gotten me involved in other creative endeavors. He's been a huge wow. participant in the like promotion of the song and the video. And like, um, he's just been like a huge champion of what I'm doing. And I would say a very similar thing about all of the other people that I've had the, the chance of working with. And I'm incredibly grateful because I, I don't think any of them truly realize the amount of momentum that they have given me to just do what I'm doing now at a level that I've dreamed about since high school. Um, it's no, been a very no, long time coming. It's been great. You though. know, when you mentioned the video you did, you, you're playing yeah. all the instruments yourself in the video, right? Yeah, so, but I need to I need to specify that like for I would strongly encourage people to look up Codependent Parasites by Fear of Water <clears throat> on YouTube. Not only am I playing all the instruments, I'm in a room with myself. So not like four different frames. It's four clones of Dave standing next to other Daves. And the director did a phenomenal job of like piecing amazing. that amazing all together. I was really, really what, happy with how that turned when, out. When I watched that, I was like, at first I didn't get it. I was just like, oh, that's they cool. Very similar. <laughs> yeah, who's that guy? Yeah. Who, and who's the guitar? They're yeah. the same people. Yeah, exactly. It's the same yeah. dude. And that's the thing, man. Like, that's, I want that to be my point of differentiation. Um, I'm, you know, I'm participating in a very crowded space and there's a ton of incredible bands out there. Um, not a lot of people doing what I'm doing. And for better or for worse, like, in a sense, it gives me a point of differentiation that I'm this guy that you've never heard of without a professional, you know, record label or a management company doing, making music with incredible people behind the scenes and partnering up with incredible people. Who, you know, who are industry or, you know, genre defining. And um, I feel like what I'm achieving on my own is gives me confidence about like the music industry as a whole and like what independent artists can achieve if you have the dedication and perseverance. I mean, I literally have 20 years of like no's of false starts of basically just <laughs> going nowhere whilst <clears throat> continuing to hone my musical craft and, and working on songwriting and learning new techniques and obviously consuming as much as music as possible to inspire me while still refining my own like specific fear of water sound. But like I easily could have given up a very long time ago because this has made me, you know, for a very long period of time, it not only did it make me no money, it cost me a tremendous amount of money. 
And, you know, playing a show on a Tuesday night to, uh, you know, basically just the sound guy, the bartender and the other band, you know, like there's a lot of demoralizing steps that can happen along the way to getting any kind of momentum whatsoever. And a lot of our favorite bands that we're talking about have also gone through those phases, right? It's not mm -hmm. like Seven Dust was just immediately amazing. Like they had to, they had to, <laughs> they had they to, had to work. grind it out. One of the things that I remember so specifically about them in the early days is that, and maybe you remember this, they bought like infomercial airtime. Yes. Uh, yes. You remember this? You, at like three in the morning, yeah. you could go to like channel four and it was like TVT records presents seven dust. And it was this really cool, like live, they bought like an hour of, uh, yeah, yep. infomercial space. That was yeah, the smartest was... thing their record company did. TVT yeah, was before, to before, buy that they, little piece. Before they disappeared. Yeah, yeah I, th I thought it exactly. was, uh, it definitely Genius. solidified it for me. Like, I I mean, yeah. to be honest, even just like hearing that Lejean was black was like that, It you know, it's, there is definitely not enough integration. Um, I think in all genres of music, but like, I'm, I've been very happy to see more, people of different backgrounds and ethnicities getting into the hard rock and metal game. But like that immediately, I was just like, cool. I mean, I'm in high school when it comes out and I looked at every other band I'm listening to very few examples of people who weren't white men. Um, <laughs> so that was cool. And then I, and you know, the song black is still to this day, like mm, just yeah. such a fucking banger, dude. It's still, I think one of their best songs. And and then I saw that their live performance I was like, dude, <laughs> and I saw, I saw them so many times on that first round of tours. And that's how I got introduced to Stained and like Skunk Anise and Cold Chamber and like all of these bands that they were touring with. And um, it's, I mean, it's literally been a, a lifelong relationship with them for me. And as I got to know them better and understood the role that Clint Lauer was playing, he joined this the highest echelon of other multi-instrumentalists. Like for my top three is Trent Reznor, Dave Grohl, Clint Lowry. So to be sitting here 20 years later and saying, I'm making music with Clint Lowry is like, Unreal. it's still kind of difficult for uh, me to m wrap my head around, but it's, I'm mean, super proud and grateful. Can you it's talk been, a, a awesome. little bit about, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, oh. Can you talk a little bit about working with Clint Lowry and the song you sent me, Shame, yes. right? I don't know yeah. if, I'm, if we're allowed to say that. The Let's be 100% able. I have no record label who can tell me what to do <laughs> or what not to do. Um, yeah, Dude, so, I love the song. It's so thank good. You. Yes. Thank you. I, I, re I appreciate you checking it out. I just knew as a fellow thank Clint you. Lowry fan and Seven Us fan that you would um, at least be interested in hearing it. I think it has elements of, I think it has enough of a seven dust flavor that it will be a very easy pill to swallow for seven dust fans. Um, but I also feel like it is still, you know, uniquely my defined sound. And, um, I, this is a song's called shame and, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm also the drummer for the band raw and for, uh, you know, do you call my name? Um, that album also came out when I was in high school. So if you told me that 20 years later, I'd be, touring on the 20th anniversary of that album i'd also say you're full of shit but um working with sahaj tikatin the lead singer of raw who's also a very prominent prolific producer who's worked with a ton of great bands um he was able to basically do an email introduction to clint and mm, you know cool. we sent him we sent him the song and again i'm, I'm just i'm thankful that i'm these people don't owe me anything. There's no like favors that I'm pulling. I have no leverage. There's nothing like that. So it's either like you either like this or you don't. And I take that as a, a sign of respect towards what I'm doing. That it's just like a, it is, it's either yes or no. And the fact that I've gotten yeses, especially from Clint Lowry was. So what do you say? Pretty, he's like, yes, amazing. I love the song. And, and I'm going to, you know, he's in the creative atmosphere. Like in the, when, when it's like getting down to business, he's very chill. Um, and like, there's like a quiet intensity there. So he was never like emphatically like, this is a fucking like skull. Let's get, turn on the gas. Um, but he, That's so I, true. I think, I think he saw the potential in it. And I say that because so this, at the point that he got it, it was for all intents and purposes, a finished song that we would have just taken my vocals out of a part of the song. And then he would have replaced it. Um, what he sent back was like totally different. He even like, changed he's like just so you know i took out the chorus and i wrote a totally different chorus and i played guitar <laughs> and drums he like did the clint lowry treatment on it which i didn't wow. i didn't ask for wasn't expecting but i'm thrilled that he did and i think that that's really where a lot of the seven dust flavor comes from um but yeah he was really good at um 
constructive, not constructive criticism, but like we had a dialogue about it and it evolved and there were multiple drafts of it. And, um, you know, I'm super proud of how that turned out. And through connecting, through doing that song, it actually led to him co-writing three of the next songs that I ended up doing with Kyle Odell. So those haven't come out yet. And those aren't, those aren't Clint features. He just co-wrote the songs with me and he, his contributions were phenomenal. He hears music very differently than I do, which is great. So like mixing those sauces together, especially from like a vocal melody standpoint, like I would have something in mind, it'd already be written, but I would just send him an instrumental version of something that I recorded and what he would send back. It'd be like a gibberish top line melody where he'd be like, -ba -da -ba -ba -do. Uh, you know, but <laughs> serious, but just no real words. And I, I would listen to it like, damn, dude, I would have never heard this fitting into these pockets, like melodically, harmonically, rhythmically, uh, you know, intensity here and vulnerability here. And um, he oh, elevated gosh. all of those songs. So, yeah, man, I just, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to, to be what a cool process, man. Yeah. Yeah. Also, oh, I have to God. say, just to be totally honest, incredibly stressful for me. Like, oh, okay. um, I'm, he, he didn't criticize me or anything, but I've never felt so critical of myself. Like, holy shit, I'm giving this, especially during the songwriting process. It's like, I'm giving hey, him you this care like, about unfinished. Oh, dude, I, yeah. I care about it. I care about how he, like, perceives me. Um, <laughs> yeah, man, it was. it's very difficult sometimes to walk that line of, like, to turn off the like i'm an enormous lifelong fan switch and just focus yeah. just get into like i'm i'm a i'm a peer you know we're both musicians <laughs> let's make you know it's that's very difficult <laughs> for someone who's had a literal lifelong um impact on me so it's it's been incredible i i think he's proud of <laughs> how the song turned out um there's no release date yet but it'll probably be um mid to late april because i currently have two singles out right now that we want to let Kind of breathe its full life like they just got sent out to radio um codependent parasites with elias was was yeah. i mean it was supported by fm Dang stations it. across the country for 14 weeks which is wow. almost unheard of for a band that you've never heard of before and it hit number 10 on the smr top 50 in february and i'm like looking at that that chart and it's like i'm spaces away from Disturbed and uh, Avenged Sevenfold and Nickelback and Blink-182 and Green Day and Metallica. And then and and then this band you've never heard of before. That's like, it kind of, it still blows my mind. Every week yeah. I would check the charts and like, look, oh, it went from 47 to 42 and from 42 to 38, went from 38 to 31. Like, um, and again, none of these stations, I have no leverage there. I have no relationships that I'm like pulling favors for. It's just like the music needs to stand on its own. And I'm incredibly rejuvenated it's very easy to be pessimistic about the state of the music industry and the opportunity for independent unknown artists to achieve anything. Um, and this process has been very invigorating, not only for myself, but like, I like sharing my story. I want people to hear this episode and be like, shit, man, like I've been wanting to do something like that. Like go do it. Like try. Right. No yeah. record company at all. Like zero on this yourself. <laughs> that is zero. crazy. Yeah. That reminds me of non-point. I mean, they're doing it on yeah. their own now. Yeah, you know? for sure. And and that's so awesome that they have gotten that. And that is actually part of what allowed us to partner in the level that we did partner. Yeah. Where they have complete control 100%. over that. Is that they've created basically their own record label. Like those guys are, and seven us too, like they're businessmen. Like they, this, oh they're not gosh. just artists. Like the fact that they have, this is what has allowed their longevity and how they've persevered in a very difficult industry is that they have sharpened their business acumen which is also difficult because they've been doing it since they were like kids pretty much like they didn't get an opportunity to like experience maybe sharpen their business acumen in like college or in like a traditional work environment or something like that so like i have a ton of respect for these guys that can survive the ups and downs of a very tumultuous industry and then go on to do things like start your own label yes. um it's, i just have so much respect for for both those bands Dude, I'm friends with uh, Mikey from Islander, and he was, Hell yeah. he had a new song that had that he he's friends with Jacoby from Papa Roach, sure. and yeah. Jacoby sent him lyrics, and he was gonna feature on a on a song. Everything yeah. was tight, and then record company said nope, and it never happened. It yeah, like, man. Oh, yeah, and that'll just that's you know that's sitting in a Dropbox file it, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That's he, so frustrating. He did the song without him, but just like had to release it without it, and it was like, man, oh, do you ever listen sucked. to the? I'm sure you've listened to this just knowing you. Have you listened to the Queen of the Dam soundtrack? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, uh Leah's last. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. But that whole yeah. soundtrack was great supposed soundtrack. to be. Uh, every song was Jonathan Davis, and at the time that that 
that this was early. This is like Kazaa, LimeWire, Napster days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like bootlegs of the all Jonathan Davis versions of that entire soundtrack made it out to the internet. But like label shut it down. And it's frustrating for corn fans, of which I'm an enormous corn fan. Um, but what it ended up doing is forcing the soundtrack to become like, okay, Marilyn Manson's singing the song and David Draymond's doing this song and the guy from Edema is doing this song. Like it, they made lemons out, of, they made lemonade out of lemons, but like, um, anyways, the point is that like, yeah, labels I never knew like, that. That's amazing. Oh, though. oh yeah, dude. Oh, dude. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. They're on like a computer that's dead or something, but like <laughs> somewhere out there in the ether, there is the entire queen of the damn soundtrack, which was written by jonathan davis is also performed by jonathan davis and that never saw the light of day because yeah yeah um and maybe i i really hope that like especially with how much it was almost 20 years ago like i hope that one day that that can officially see the light of day and jonathan davis can be like no like come at me bro like (laughs) (laughs) like the people want to hear this did you see that announcement that they did i think it was just yesterday about yeah the 30 year anniversary i saw them during the 25th yeah the 25th anniversary i think they came to atlanta and did the whole thing yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. I, I got a chance. I saw him with talk. Fildy, though. That's when I oh, saw him. Yeah. Do the I guess Fildy's not going to be on the 30th. I don't know. I mean, but, at this yeah. point, it's like, that's the thing. Like, life happens, right? Like, people have families. People, dude, I don't know that I wouldn't be burnt out of touring after 30 years of doing yeah. it. And also, if you like lived a pretty heavy party lifestyle at a certain point, like, at this point, I don't blame people for hanging it up or at least taking a step back. Um, actually a good example of that is Anne Berlin, um, Maddie from Memphis Mayfire is doing, Mm -hmm. is, is going to be their touring vocalist, but the, the original vocalist of Anne Berlin is just, just stepping back in terms, he's still the official lead singer. He's going to do the albums, but then Maddie's going to go out on tour with them, which at first I was like, I don't, I can't hear that at all. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with Anne Berlin, but like very different, different totally different bands in my mind but um <laughs> but maddie's been posting a bunch of like isolated vocal stuff of him singing Anne berlin is like um this is i mean i, I kind of like it more so he's, oh, really? he's such a dude he's such a good vocalist and his ability to because he can like emulate exactly what the singer of Anne berlin does but then like also rip it which Anne berlin guy either chooses not to or can't but you know matt maddie can like fucking rage when he wants to so like for him to like put some stank on some high notes and like really dig in um uh, kind of gives the song a whole new life so yeah i'm very excited about <laughs> seeing them out there live, that's cool i sure. need to check this out yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you know you mentioned different bands nothing more you're, yeah. you're a drum tech how yes. did this happen how did you become a drum tech for nothing <laughs> it's, more it's a funny story um so i'm a huge huge nothing more fan um they among art other artists along the way like i've always been inspired by progressive music and that term can be very vague in general but the core aspect of progressive music that i like is that it is not defined by the structure that most mainstream music tends to stick to where it's like and i'll just give some basic examples like the song can't be more than four minutes long and every chorus needs to be an exact same thing and it needs to be super catchy so people are repeating it like it has to be as consumable as possible and in a lot of scenarios it's like if it can sound as much as your previous single or as much as some other number one song you know the more the better and when bands come out when someone like periphery or tesseract and i would put nothing more in this um category when they come out with like spirits on their last album like they, the first the lead single is seven minutes long and they're not tool like you don't you don't just automatically get to do that like they're taking swings out there they want to participate in the world of mainstream rock but they're not mainstream and uh i have a great deal of, of respect and appreciation for that plus their live performance is insane so been a fan since the since the few not fleeting came out so like basically their first album and in 2018 i <laughs> i went to a music festival in san antonio where they're from they're not playing the music festival but i'm wearing a nothing more t-shirt and i am chock full of mushrooms like many 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 <laughs> mushrooms how many and like are you talking uh, about a handful or just no like five grams so it's called like the okay. hero's journey where like literally my face is melting off and i'm sweating and i just you know um yeah so it, it was fun so i'm kind of just like wandering through the parking lot where the um, festival is and this woman comes up to me and she's like hey do you like that band it's like oh dude you've never heard of nothing oh my god let me tell you and she's like hold on she got real close and she's like I have a secret you can't tell anyone, but the guitar player put a baby in me. 
And oh. I, I don't know if she could tell that I was super fucked up or whatever. I was like, oh my, oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Like, okay. <laughs> Does anyone know? And like, as I'm like consoling her, she just like slowly turns my body around and Mark, the guitar player, is standing right behind me. I'm like, oh, do you know her? He's like, yeah, that's, that's my wife. So I was like, oh. And what I thought would have been like oh, a two so minute funny. interaction of like, hey man, big fan, like cool. And then geek out for two minutes. We hung out for like two hours and just like got the three of us and their other friend just got beers and went and watched a bunch of other bands and we exchanged phone numbers. And I was like, holy shit, man. So I like started a friendship with Mark under crazy circumstances that is and then, so crazy yeah. yeah and then in 2019 um i am in very randomly i am in uh medellin colombia and i get a text from mark that says hey man uh you know i follow you on instagram i've been seeing you've been posting pictures from medellin um our drum tech fell in love with someone on the tour that we just did and she's from medellin the tour just ended and he's just moving with her impulsively back to medellin and he wow. gets there tonight and it's like well actually tonight's my last night and he said I, he's like, I don't know you that well, but I know you well enough that I think you guys would meld perfectly. So I really want you guys to get together. I'm going to give him his phone number. Same thing like with Mark, where I thought it was just going to be like, get together for one beer. Like, hey, man, nothing more. Cool. Nope. That turned into like partying until my plane left the next day, which was a nightmare. I was so oh, yeah. hungover, <laughs> but we had you, such a drunk and time. hungover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, going from South America uh, back to Texas was was a nightmare but i formed a great friendship with uh brian roll is was is is his name he was the drum tech um he and then in tw post covid post quarantine he needed to step back from being the drum tech to attend to some family issues and nothing more takes their crew positions very seriously it's not just like okay any drum tech it's like no we've toured with you before we know you're reliable you're good at your job um you know we know that you feel valued and we feel we hear we, we see value in you like they're very intentional and they want the same people for every single tour so for him to step back the replacement was a big deal and um brian had me come out and go on tour for a few shows with nothing more and like so they could also see me like on the bus and like am i a functional human let alone just like a musician <laughs> that understands the job and yeah we all kind of just mutually agreed that this this is a good fit we're gonna do this i'd never drum tech before but i'm a lifelong drummer and fan of the band so like i had the skill set and knowledge of the music that i was able to step in and do it um the tour was and the band would absolutely say this without hesitation the tour was awful it was one of the worst tours that they've ever done you know the murphy's law like whatever whatever bad thing can happen will happen yeah oh my god like from the very first show and this is in this moment sleep token nothing more. and and your first gig with them right is it yes is it, absolutely yeah <laughs> the, the worst yeah. comes right when you mm -hmm. start yep yeah. and i couldn't help but feel like it you know i'm the i'm the factor here like right. i'm the yeah. only new thing about this but like we had three buses break down we had to fire two bus drivers we had a guy show up blackout drunk to drive the bus oh, no. um there was another bus driver on the tour that was like actively he was like sending dick pics to to um uh Corey Taylor's wife, who was out with us on tour um, with the cherry bombs, and she was like, "That's totally fucking unacceptable." Oh God! And the 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 industries, like the touring industry, is so crazy right now because of everyone who couldn't tour in 2020 and 2021, all went out at the same time in 2022. So there's this massive shortage of buses and even less people to drive them. Yeah. So this dude is able to massively offend a pretty important person in our industry. And she's just immediately is like, fuck you, you're done. And he's like, cool, you have 30 minutes to get all of your shit off my bus or I'm driving away. And this should be something that ends a dude's career forever. Like you can't even go be a bus driver in China or yeah. whatever. Nope, that dude had a job the next day. Uh, it's just in insane. The demand, oh, wow. the total imbalance of just like they're in this incredible position. So there and there's plenty of there's way more amazing drivers out there who are friends with the bands. And you Is literally he still driving. Your, a, yeah, I, know I don't know. About, I don't know now. about two years later. I, I hope not. Um, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't kept up with it. But dude, I mean, other things like on the way to Aftershock, we hit a fucking bear, a bear on the freeway. <laughs> we hit a bear like 65 miles per hour, which is like hitting a van. And Everybody OK. It, Sp not uh, the, bear, the, bear, the bear is not okay i'll tell you that um we you know at, at something like aftershock all the bands are supposed to be loaded in and set up at like eight in the morning nothing more playing at like four 
our new, so like a new truck needed to come out. We needed to swap all of the gear out of the thing that was covered in bear guts into the new truck and then make it to the <laughs> festival and then navigate through the festival. It's easier to do that when no one's in there at seven in the morning, but this is in the middle of the day. So literally every other crew, this was such like a cool community effort where every other crew member of every band that was performing that day that wasn't busy just all lined up and it was this an amazing effort of like 75 crew guys just like get shit off the truck and like we had to have that a full semi packed to the ceiling totally unloaded set up wired properly sound checked on a stage ready to play for 75,000 people in like 30 minutes which is just unheard of and and we made it work and it was it was incredible but it's just like Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. We persevered. There were still tons of good shows, but like, and you um, survived. Yeah, you made it. I survived. Through. Yeah, no one, no one. So died. I give you a lot of credit yeah. right then. They're like, Thank oh, you. he can do in the Thank trenches. You. Um, and honestly, just part of like, I have no desire. I didn't have a desire, and I still don't have a desire. That I don't want that to be my profession, but to help execute uh, a live performance of one of my all-time favorite bands um, meant the world to me. And I think that a big way that they repaid that to me is that. Um, on their last show, they sold out the machine shop and they had me play with them. Yes, and, it's on YouTube. Yes, yeah, it's, it's on YouTube. Good. It's on the Fear Water Facebook page. And it was a true bucket list moment for me uh, performing. Like, and it, dude, it's awesome. In the video, Johnny's like, we've You're never smiling. done this before. Uh, we, 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 have, we have never practiced with this guy before. And fuck <laughs> it, we're just going to try it. And the crowd's like, Dave, Dave, Dave. And then Johnny's like, do you really want it? And then just fucking kicks in. And like, I got just got goosebumps thinking about it, man. Like, it was so fucking rad. So, um, so were you uh, talk about when you were on there, were you nervous, just excited? Yes. I mean, you knew yes, the song. Dude. Yeah, I knew the song, but I still was in the parking lot for an hour air drumming. I was like, okay, I need to make sure that I fucking got all these things. Like I'm a very confident performer, but the pressure of yeah, one just song, so unexpected. Once, yeah. once yeah. yeah, I was just like, literally the an hour before the show started, they're like, all right, you're going to do that song. It's like, yes yes i am but so didn't didn't show my concern but i was immediately like this has to go fucking incredible and it did it really was i felt like i could fight a grizzly bear once i got off stage i was like that is yes fuck yeah so yeah how do you great, come man. down from that yeah it was it, it was amazing and that was the end of the tour but so i've maintained a really uh. good friendship with them they have uh, a new drum tech who's like he wants to be a drum tech in the way that I want to be a musician. And I'm glad that he has the role. He's amazing at the job. His name's Nikki. Super nice dude. Super energetic and, and passionate. And, um, you know, I continue to go. I love that band so much and that crew that, like, over the summer, just for shits, I went to um, Amsterdam, Luxembourg, and Hellfest outside of Paris just to hang with those guys and, and go to shows oh, and just, cool. you know, experience it. And I feel very fortunate to be a part of the Nothing More family. And... Um, I, I'll say this for musicians and just people. This is a good rule in life. Like, be a good person. Just be a nice, compassionate human. It's not inauthentic. Like, just care about other people. And that's going to open up more doors than you might expect. Like, if people know you because for one reason that you're just a nice, decent person, like, it's going to do things for you. And I think that that very much applies to you. Like, I think that that oh, is a big you, part man. of, like, what helps, like, you, man get people on your show and like i feel even though it can be incredibly difficult and frustrating and full of pitfalls and it can be really expensive and you have no idea what's around the next corner i'm still incredibly yeah. excited to be doing what i'm doing and i try to never forget that in even the most stressful scenarios and I, I it's important for me to like exude that positivity and that gratefulness and it helps me be mindful of like living in the moment and like still appreciating like holy shit man this is this is a sold out crowd or I'm standing in front of 80,000 people or I get to make music with Clint Lowry or I'm sitting on the show talking to you after I've been watching your show for several years. Like, it's, wow, thank you. They're all very cool, very cool moments. So, yeah, when you when you've been doing you've been doing uh, Fear of Music for so long now, have you ever thought have you ever had the opportunity to join another band or was that ever like a temptation or to keep this one yes. band going? Yeah. So it's an important it's an important question because it has a lot to do with what I want to do moving forward. So. You know, I, I recorded an EP essentially with Sahaj Tikatin in December of 2021. And he asked me at the start of that day one of that session, he's like, so you don't have a band. What do you what do you want to do with Fear of Water? And what I told him is what I would tell you is that for me, Fear of Water is first and foremost, a artistic vehicle for me for like processing emotions and catharsis and like telling my story and other people's stories in a, in a way that I think is compelling. Secondarily to that is fear of water to me is like my audio resume. 
And I am using, I'm trying to do my best work possible to get in front of the right people in the right place at the right time, because I'm completely open. In fact, I very much so want to like join an established organization that is like signed touring, like has a, you know, built in fan base is going to be recording in the future. Like that is so much more appealing to me than building a band around my music and like, you know, getting in a van and just like living off of our dreams and cigarettes. Like, um, so like networking with these featured artists, with producers, with engineers, with managers, with festival yeah, managers and stuff like that. Um, but so I explained that to Sahaj before we record one second of music. And he's like, yeah, that's not how that works. I'm like, okay. okay. I mean, it's, that's what I'm going to try to do. Like, it's, it's my goal. I understand that it's not conventional, but that's what I'm going to do. And he's like, mm, okay, well, it's, you know, it's your money. Let's go record some, some music. <laughs> and then at the end of three weeks, after he sees me, I, the, here's these songs that I've written to see me playing guitar and bass and drums and singing and doing the programming and playing keys. And like, he's like, so yeah, I've been thinking about this for the three weeks we've been working together. Um, you know, how do you feel about joining raw? And I was like, yeah, I feel pretty fucking good about that, man. Like at no point in time was I thinking recording with Sahaj is going to be a tryout for raw. Uh, it's just a very cool byproduct of pursuing what I'm pursuing. Now raw is a very like, uh episodic like it's not it's not a full-time thing at all and he makes way more money producing other bands than going out on tour and like him and i are totally on the same page with that so it's been a great opportunity for me but i'm actively seeking a much more serious full-time position and if you pay attention at all to the music industry like there are turnover happening in very legit bands all the time like things that come to mind right off the top of the head is like bring me the horizons keyboard player uh, left pop evil's drummer left day seekers drummer left oh, uh uh you know smash pumpkins had a guitar player leave like there's all of these different examples um even butcher babies their drummer left like the i want to be in that go yeah, ahead i'm sorry i, no, no, I want to be in that role i want to be in that rolodex i want to be top of mind the next time one of those opportunities comes up and like i am so eager and ready to like bring someone else's music to life and but bring my you know full suite of multi-instrumentalist skills to the table and also you know 20 years of being a professional musician and my tour experience and the fact that i'm like a fully functional responsible adult and i have no addictions and like all, you know i check all of these boxes so like i said fear water is like my audio resume and this is by talking to you and having music on the air is like this is this is my application process so <laughs> oh yeah, that, yes that, that's kind of where i'm at yeah you're the perfect candidate, you know, like, no, I, I, I was gonna ask you that, you know, vices, you're like, you're like, I'm addicted to nothing. You know, like, it, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. I'm, well, dude, the thing is, and I've, you know, I've, I've had my, my shitty phases. Um, you know, I, I would, I've never like battled addiction, but I've definitely like made bad choices in college. You know, I was drank like college kids do. Yeah. Well, the, the irony is that but it's good is that my delayed success in music has equipped me with the life experience and the business acumen and the maturity to be able to succeed with longevity moving forward. If I had any of the opportunities in my twenties that I do now, I would have fucked it up for sure. I have no doubt yeah. that I would have run it into the ground or got burnt out or surrounded myself with the wrong people. Like I just wasn't ready and I would have killed for it, dude. I would have done terrible things to have the opportunity to even be like playing the 1 PM set at aftershock or to be like the third opener on a seven dust tour like to me that was everything i didn't give a shit about anything else and it was honestly so depressing that i couldn't get out of wisconsin that i couldn't i just felt like i was going nowhere except for i'm continuing to write as much music as possible i'm continuing to refine my skill set and it just felt like no, nothing's happening so moving to austin in 2016 was a huge part of like getting out of that rut and starting to network, meeting Mark from nothing more in 2018, working with Sahaj in 2021. There's a lot of other just examples of that where I've really put myself out there trying to make the best music that I can. I'm always trying to level up and work with the next, you know, a great producer who can help focus my creative talents in a specific way. I'm trying to work with as, as wide of a variety as featured artists as possible. I'm trying to do as many interviews as possible. I'm trying to like, yeah work my social as much as possible and like I, I take this very seriously um but it's it's been a fun ride so far it's just been a really long 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 ride a long ride yeah and you, yeah. you keep mentioning this band raw i i i don't know this band how do, can people find them like what what when where is this band from raw 
Is, am I saying that right? How do you spell yeah, that? R-A. R- 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 I think if you heard R- that, R- like, R- like R- do you call my name? My da, 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 da. So, uh, I'll okay, I'm going to look it up after this. Okay. I'm going to drop I'm it sure, in during the interview. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure the people listening are like yelling at the at their phone right now. Like, you know this fucking song. Like, you know it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was I'm it gonna, was yeah. inescapable early t- like 2002. It was just one of those songs that like you just couldn't. I know I'm going to know. Away from, yeah. So, um, and and you know Sahaj. So he at the time. So the band was formed in L.A. Um, and they have quite a few. Um, the, the, do you call my name was by far like the best commercial success for them, but they had several other uh, charting singles and Sahaj, the lead singer has continued to put out music under the name of raw R a um, since then. And he just keeps getting better and better. But in the meantime, he's been working with like Motley Crue and star set and bad wolves and nothing more. And wow. he, like his name is attached to some very serious, successful music. And he's a phenomenal writer and producer. So working with him, was amazing and then getting the opportunity to play and tour with him um as well as the other bandmates was was incredible and like all of these things are just you know i look at it as like i'm a yeah. snowball on the top of a mountain and i'm going down and i'm just picking up speed and the ball's getting bigger and i'm just i'm trying to say yes to as many smart opportunities as possible but like yeah uh raw is very it's like this like middle eastern influenced egyptian new metal um as like a fan of corn like there's i guarantee you're gonna love this band if you don't okay, already yeah. know them and it's just like, you, the light bulb's yeah. not going off but like yeah man yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. usually what happens yeah yeah but like it's bulb. like i said that's a it's a temporary thing um he just like doesn't really tour at all except for like select opportunities he's not really putting out new music because it just makes mo- so much more sense to work with other bands and his studio is at his home so he gets to be with his wife and his child and i you know i get it and he's in his like mid 50s so like you know, that part of his life is not as active as like where I'm at in life right now, where I'm like, put me out there, dude. Like I'm sitting on the bench and like, put me in coach. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, I'm going to just keep doing these collaborations and, and working with, um, like at the end of this month, I'm going to be working with, uh, Joseph McQueen who has done all of, um, Howard Jones of kill switch engage. He's done like light the torch and scion and, um, those kind of projects and bad wolves. And he's, he's incredible. Like the stuff that he puts out sounds enormous and wow. I'm going to, I'm going to dip into that. And, you know, after I'm going to do three songs with him and then who knows, maybe I'm working with wizard blood or Elvis, you know, that, um, uh, seven dust works, Elvis, you know, they've done. Elvis yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, he's absolutely on the list. Um, and I'm going to just keep doing this and see what doors it opens up. And honestly, even if it doesn't, even if I don't achieve the thing that I've just described to you, it will, I, this is still so satisfactory and fulfilling to be able to create music that I'm so proud of and be able to share it with you and everyone else who's listening and I'm, having this opportunity to work too. with these artists. has been great, dude. Bone, Bones, uh, I was talking to Bones from Stuck Mojo, and he had an idea. I don't know if it's fruition. I don't know what's going on with it, but it reminds me of what you're doing because he was like, I'm going to do an album called Bones and Friends. And yeah. every song is just collaborating with a different artist, man. Would yeah, someone recently like called me the Carlos Santana of metal. So I was like, okay, I'll take that, man. <laughs> I got to <laughs> yeah, call dude. Rob Thomas and like do that's a song. That's so with him. funny. Oh, yeah. 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 Dude, that's speaking perfect. of Stuck Mojo, uh, two weeks ago, I, I sat down with uh, Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson, uh, big shout out. Great interview. Dude, so uh, his energy, I just got goosebumps again thinking, like, I could have yeah. talked to that guy for five hours. Like, he was just so like, yeah. He's awesome, man. Like he keeps he keeps it going. He's very invested in what he's saying. His energy and lifelong love of music is so ubiquitous throughout like every single thing that he says. And it's it's a joy to connect with someone like that who's he, just so deeply ingrained. Absolutely. And he, you know, he was uh the after bones, he fronted Stuck Mojo for yeah. people don't know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tremendous performer. Absolutely. And I told him, I was like, dude, I've I've like middle school high school dave yeah. has, has seen you like i've i've seen stuck mojo so many different times Me too. throughout the years um because they, they've so done cool. those circuits with like um with, i mean seeing like being religious about following seven dust has introduced me to so many other bands that i still love to this day uh which has been great but definitely i've, I've got introduced to stuck mojo i'm sure through one of the five hundred thousand tours that seven dust has done so yeah so sure. when, guys. when Lord- Lord Nelson, you know, and during in your, when he was interviewing, he was like, I'd like to be in that camp. I'd like to work with you. I was yeah. thinking, like, that would be so cool, you know, to have yeah, him dude. rhyme over some of your stuff. That'd be yeah. really cool. Uh, uh, yeah. And that was not like lip service. Like, if, uh, like, I want to work with as many people 
as possible. Um, w- the one caveat to that is that like, not to sound not, it's not like elitist, but like, I, I need to be working with people who can get me in front of their fan bases. Like this is part of like a step, you know, like I said, it's my resume. I'm networking. trying to, yep. exactly. This is my form of like audio networking. And I really hope to one day be able to pay that forward when I'm in a position, when an independent artist who's making music out of his spare bedroom reaches out to me and I'm able to provide the type of you know, exposure it. that could help them. You know, it's, I think that that's so important in so many different creative endeavors to like not close the door behind you, as they say. So I would take great pride in being able to help others someday. That'd be great. I, I love that dude, man. It, we're, we're very similar. When you left for uh when you left Wisconsin and went to Texas, are you close yeah. to your family? I mean, was that, that's a huge thing moving, right? Yeah. And, so tell that to the rest of my family. Cause they had all left before <laughs> me, man. I was the oh, last person there. Every single one <laughs> left and I'm the youngest. So like I got out of college, the, the latest and like, I was also just a crazy poor, like so poor. So I was living in my friend's attic, sleeping on a mattress on the ground that came with the house when they bought it. Oh. It was a room that had one outlet in it with two plugs but you, I, but it, it couldn't handle the houses built in the like early 1800s. So I could either have a light on or a space heater on, but not both at the not same both. time. <laughs> and this is an attic without insulation in the middle of winter in Wisconsin. Like I've roughed oh. it out, dude. Like I've, I've paid my dues in terms of, <laughs> I've got, I've done like the rock star grungy thing with, with none of the glory for a very long time. <laughs> so yeah. like, I feel like I've paid my dues. Um, you know, I've, I've been able to <clears throat> achieve you know, business success, uh, from a marketing perspective, I actually own, I opened my own ad agency after, uh, running social media departments for huge ad agencies for the better part of a decade, started my own agency, which allowed me the work-life balance to be able to invest in taking bigger swings and working with bigger people. And then like, even going, like going out with nothing more was a huge pay cut for me. And that's not to say anything about like, they're underpaying their people. It's just that like, I've, I've been, I've done, been very successful with my agency, but I like completely stepped away from that. So I could completely dedicate myself to an artistic endeavor. And that's, I'm very fortunate that I'm in a position to do that. Um, it almost makes me feel I, so I get imposter syndrome all the time. Do you ever have that feeling? Oh God. Yeah, I do. And a lot of people do. I, a lot of people I interview have that. Yeah. That's a common, you get that too. Oh dude. <laughs> so much I'm, so like I'm there's this part of me that do. feels like there's this part of me that feels like i need to close my company down if i'm not if all of my eggs are not in this basket then i'm not as committed as other people who is like it's this or nothing i feel that all the time when i when i see wow. like streaming numbers skyrocket i'm like i don't get it when a huge thing for me is when that when P- codependent parasites started climbing the charts um i had ne- until it was on octane three months later, I'd never once heard it on the radio. So there's this huge voice going off in my head is like, this isn't real. You haven't heard it on the radio. You're, you're just looking at some chart from some company that you have no connection to. And you're next to all these bands that you've been listening to for 25 years that have huge fan bases and professional record labels behind them. There's no reason that you should be playing in the same sandbox. I struggle with that feeling every day and, and you're not on I'm, tour you're not on no, tour so you're not seeing no, fans in exactly. front of you that's a huge yeah. thing i don't have that like i'm getting like mathematical validation not human interaction yeah. i'm not talking to fans by the merch table i'm not hearing right. people sing yeah. the music that's back to trip me. yeah dude so like it's a it is a very real thing i will say it it does keep me humble um and even hearing like in the interview that you were doing with clint where he was talking about like i think he is and I'm not alone in this thinking that he's just such a masterful songwriter and he has so much passion and so much talent, but to hear him talk about getting like shy on stage and being uncomfortable oh, being a front that. man, yeah. I was like, what are you talking about, dude? Exactly. How, could, how could you possibly feel that way? First of all, after doing it your whole life and being so objectively good by so many metrics, um, there's something comforting hearing your heroes be like, I struggle yeah. in this way too. So like, it's, it's a very, it's a very real thing. So, yeah. Oh, I've heard that before too, man. That that that's wild. I've I've felt that as well. Um, you know, you and I are probably the same age and everything. I love music from the '90s and like the first bands that got me into metal and mu- I love everything. Me too, dude. though. Yeah, and but ni- I, '90s I'm, is where my heart will always be. Like I'm so rooted yes. in that. Yeah. yeah, I've heard you mention like like the Smash, my Offspring. That's the classic yep. for me and nirvana and pretty hate machine and you know yep. all these bands me and you listen to the same thing what was the band <laughs> that got you started like who what, what's the earliest 
album you can think of that you know got you influenced so so the first do you remember the first cd that you bought yeah i do it's kind of embarrassing no mine too mine too that's why i'm laughing all right mine is uh, mine is uh tom cochran the laugh is a highway (laughs) that was my my first album i couldn't name another song off of that album if you paid me a billion dollars i just i have no that's the only song mine was the bodyguard soundtrack the the (laughs) Houston. i will always love you soundtrack That's so funny. Like, why? Why do you think? Was it because of the Whitney song? Like, what was I it guess about so. that I, you I, wanted that? I, I played baseball, and and ever, and that was like the hottest movie. And CDs were brand new, and it was just like, here's here's this album. Yeah, there we go. But anyway, so, yeah, we. we so to that the same had no stuff. influence on me whatsoever. I just very vividly remember being like, because also just like having a seat. C- it's crazy, dude. We are definitely the same age. Like when I got my first like disc, man, I was like, holy shit, man! Like I've been listening <laughs> to cassettes. This is bullshit. Um, but definitely, uh, never mind by Nirvana is yes. the most impactful yeah. album on me. And I and I went through this really critical transition as I fell in love with this album, which is. Um, I started off as I think the overwhelming majority of music consumers do where it's like you care most about the lead singer, his voice and like the song as a whole. Right. So it's like if you asked me, and dude, I, this is like literally second or third grade. So I'd be like, I love Kurt Cobain or like, you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit is a cool song. I would have never mentioned Dave Grohl during that time period. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to me mention too. something about me that's really hard to summarize but it's <laughs> but in general something an important thing to know about me is that i was born clinically deaf and i went through mm-hmm. this enormous recovery process that took well over 10 years to get functional hearing back and then catch up cognitively because i was so far behind everyone else and music was a huge part of that recovery and uh in fourth grade everyone in my grade school got a chance to try out for band and i wanted to play saxophone so bad i don't remember why it just seemed like the coolest instrument And during the trial process, everyone goes through the same thing where you get this plastic recorder. It's like a plastic flute with three holes on it. And you play like hot cross buns or jingle bells or something like that. And I fucking bombed so hard. Like I could not do it. I didn't, I couldn't read music. I didn't have the hand-eye coordination. I was terrible. And And my band teacher could tell how badly I wanted this, but also that I was fully aware of the fact that I sucked so bad. And he told me, and I appreciate this. So if I could get into a time machine and hug this man, I would. He told me that, he, I didn't have no concept of a saxophone, like the engineering of it. But he's like, if you struggle with the three notes on a song flute on a recorder, a saxophone will make you want to quit music. It is so complicated and convoluted and it requires both hands. And there's like 45 buttons on it. And the last thing I want you to do is end your relationship with music before it starts. So I think you'd be better suited to be in the percussion section and see if you can thrive there and we'll go from there and at first i was so resentful i was like fuck you man like this is bullshit like i totally viewed it as like the detention center of band like you just stuffing people in the back of the room yeah you got demoted at that point in your mind dude i totally viewed it as that and then two weeks into band when we started like playing some songs i remember we played like the jurassic park theme song i realized that i'm not in the (laughs) i'm not in the back i'm in the driver's seat I realized that the 50 kids in front of me, that even though they aren't facing me, they're following me and my fellow percussionists. And I realized that all of the power and drive and tempo and dynamic, like you are the cue for like, this is a big part, this is a soft part, is all coming from the back of the room, is all coming from the percussion. And that totally changed the way that I heard all music. And I went back to Nevermind and I was like, oh, the reason I really love Nevermind is Dave Grohl is absolutely ripping all of our faces off that this that you know i was also listening to like metallica and other bands at that time that had big drum sounds but there's something so specifically tasty about what dave Grohl does and i realized this is what i'm really sinking my teeth into and that inspired me to like get my first total piece of shit drum set and just start to try to teach myself and it was an incredibly difficult process but like he from that moment on um, Dave Grohl has been this, the number one guy for me in terms of like inspiring me and like seeing him, the fact that <laughs> so many decades later, he's not only like still making music, but Foo Fighters is <clears throat> arguably the biggest rock band in the world. He's a New York times bestselling author. He's done all these amazing documentaries. He's worked with so many cool artists. Like, um, I feel very fortunate to this much later in life past my childhood still that the fact that I can still see tool the fact that nine inch nails is still doing incredible stuff that seven dust and non-point are still these are like core youth memories for me and those guys are still out there crushing it these aren't guys who are like 
retired and play twice a year at a state fair or something like they're doing it they're still leading the charge yeah. they're still making they're keeping us motivated music. are you exactly, motivated dude. like no for you too dude like that's what i'm saying is like you no. you are on the front lines in your own creative way and obviously you care enough about like what they represent in their history and their future that you want to have them on your show like it matters a lot um new music is also really great and important but like having these men and women who've been around for so long and survived some of the worst parts of the music industry and have survived like even the like suicide of your lead singer or something like that oh, we yeah. need more people like that to help keep our music authentic and grounded and connected to the human experience instead of just being this like commercial factory of like how many songs that sound exactly like the last bring me horizon single can we pump out so when you know i just realized I, what's that i just realized i, I had my my good company hoodie yes right <laughs> i just i just looked behind me I was oh, like, oh shit, that, that's right. <laughs> dude i sent you that i'm totally you did send out me right. that i didn't know if you were gonna remember that yeah man like you yeah. I, I messaged you like a while ago i've, I've been following you for a long yeah, time yeah like, that's a long time ago um that's another thing like, you do a good job of being an ambassador of um not only the industry but like the genre specifically and the fan community and you just do, do a good job of like evangelizing yourself um Dude, i thought so that much. it meant a lot to me to like get stickers and a hood you had nothing to gain from giving I, you know i don't have any like leverage or whatever so yeah it was great no 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 it, I'm it, just it, a fan. it stuck with me for sure yeah thank I, you so much great, man. man that for means sure, a lot to me um You're doing so it right we, that's what i'm saying <laughs> thank you man you are too and 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 this is maybe a silly question but when when i was kind of researching all the stuff you've done yep. i can't help but to go on youtube and you type fear of water and yep. you don't type band you get a whole lot of fear of people fear of water you do um, you do yeah where did this name come from fear of water so fear of water uh touched on that a little bit at the beginning of our discussion here but like oh yes er, yeah, I'm sorry. Er, yeah but but early but like really what it's truly rooted in is that i mean this goes back to high school um i would never have you know i was never like a loner but i never had any sort of click i was never i never had like a phase or a group of people that i identified with. i had friends but like i really struggled with i, I it's important for me to, to be humble. And I never say something like this to be like, I was cool before everyone else. It just, I was acutely aware of the like groupings of people that there was this, like we were making our own society seven hours a day, five days a week in this high school. And it like bothered me immediately that there was this hierarchy of like, Oh, these are hot chicks. And these are like plain girls or like, that's how it these was. Are, yeah. These are jocks. Preppy. And like, these are goth people. And like, they get their ass kicked after school. I was like, why is this happening? Like, we're all going through puberty at the same time. We're all dealing with a lot of the same shit. And I never adhered to any of that. And there were downfalls of that. Like I, you know, this is, sounds petty, but at the time high school is your whole life. So like there'd be parties all the time. I'm not getting invited to, or there'd be like um, girls who'd be uncomfortable about like me asking them out or whatever. Cause they couldn't even like, who are you? Like, what's your, what's your thing? What's your identity? Why don't you have like, why aren't you a skater kid or why aren't you a jock or why, why don't you have some sort of defined thing that I can connect to these preconceived notions of what kids should be. And that construct absolutely continues when we get out of high school, we just, it gets diluted by a bunch of other things and we end up living our entire lives that way. And I fucking hate it. Yeah. And a lot of bad stuff comes from that. So as early as high school, I was writing under the name of fear of water. And then what that is, is it's, it's a reference to the body being composed of 70, 80% water and it's the fear of like being not only being true to yourself but living yourself embracing what you are actually made out of and sharing that with the world um even in the face of it being rejected even if you know for a fact that this isn't what's popular trendy mainstream if this is going to make you an other or an outcast i think and it's hard to have perspective as a 16 year old but a life well lived is a life where you know yourself and you can articulate that to yourself when you're alone in your thoughts or you're with your loved ones, or, you know, as you find your community later in life, like the more at peace you are with yourself and embrace your weirdness and your in idiosyncrasies and, and all of these things, like you're going to be a happier, more fulfilled person. It's all about quality over quantity in almost everything in life. So fear of water is absolutely about acknowledging the reality of that fear of what it means to not conform, confronting it, giving it a name, embracing the fact that we're all susceptible to it and then acting in in this truly dignified way of be like no that's not who i am like i get that this is what's popular but like this is what i believe in this is where i come from um this is 
my water and I'm going to proudly speak it and wear it or say it or sing it or whatever your medium is. Um, so yeah, it's, it, that's been a, a huge driving force for like a, a lot of my writing is just that understand. I'm not saying like fuck Western society and go live in a convent somewhere, but like it just, there is not enough encouragement. Um, there's just so many arbiters of what's cool in so many different areas of life. And there's so much is about like, it's our group and your group and what's cool and what's not. And you're sexy and you're not, and this is in and this is out. And it's like, those things can still exist, but shouldn't actually define people's entire identity. It shouldn't make them feel bad about themselves. And yeah, for me, fear of water is, is a conversation about that whole phenomenon that I think impacts almost every single person alive. That's one hell of an answer, man. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That is great. Um, kind of sometimes I just say like I fell in a pool once when I was five and it really scared me. You know, sometimes <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give the whole diatribe, but yeah, man, that's, that's the real right. answer. No, no that, that really answer is great. Um, uh, going like kind of closing up with what's your future? Like what's going on? You got the Clint Lowry song coming out. When is that coming yep. out? Um, there's not a set date. I wanted to, I'm very cognizant of like, um, it's easier for one of my collaborative partners to be an active part of the like release of it and the promotion and whatnot when they're not on tour. And Seven Us has been pretty active. Um, at, you know, they always have their New Year's shows and they've been pretty active um, in 2024 so far. So I've been mindful of like not, I would like Clint to have like an at home stretch of time when I release that song so he can like be a part of it as well. And I'm not hitting him up while he's like, getting four hours of sleep in between shows and be like, Hey man, can you make some posts? Like I want to be very considerate of that. And, and fortunately I have a lot of other good things going on and other pieces of music and collaborations that are in the works that there's plenty to, to fill the pipeline. Um, and yeah, I've, I've even just today started talking to someone who I'm incredibly excited about and, and I don't want to, I don't want to confirm. I don't want to say anything until it's confirmed, but like there's still some really exciting opportunities out there in terms of who I'm connecting with to, to make new music and uh, yeah i'm gonna just keep keep doing that so i have a, the song with clint and i have a song featuring sahaj ticketin of raw which you're going to check out as soon as we're done talking it out. yeah no, um, no, no, i know this song yeah oh so, yeah that's yeah, song. Yeah. yeah um but yeah i have, I have uh, <clears throat> a bunch of other songs in the works and i'm gonna just keep doing it's gonna keep making like what i hope to be is interesting music videos like the uh, i just released yesterday a music video for one day featuring heidi shepherd of butcher babies and it's this sounds weird it is modern ballet and i had never done anything like this before i found a choreography group that had some really cool video examples i sent them the song and i was like i want to sit down with you and go line by line through this entire song and tell you what part of my heart that this comes from and what it means to me and it's about this relationship between me and my mom and the inevitability oh. of her death and what we all go through and losing our parents it's one of the hardest things in life but it's also such a universal experience and it's like can you tell that story through dance and they stepped up to the challenge in a big way like i'm so proud oh God. of how that turned out and then like the video that you saw where it's like four clones of me in a room playing together like i want to do interesting music videos to go along with what, what i hope is interesting music for a guy that's in an interesting unconventional position and i'm going to just keep doing this until maybe nothing happens but i'm going to keep putting out what i think is really good music and doing what I can to support it and exploring different, you know, parts of the creative universe. And yeah, man, just, I'm just going Dude, for it. Whatever that is. I, I'm sorry about, about the loss of your mom. That that's, that's terrible, man. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, is that what that song's about though? One day you yeah, said this one day. Wow. Yep, yeah. Okay. And I just, I it, really back and listen to it, now. it really struck me that, um, you know, it, it seems so obvious, but it's also so profound that like barring some sort of tragedy where we die before our parents, like yeah. we will all lose the people who brought us into this world. And like, in a lot of cases made us the men and women who we are and like who we literally depended on for our survival. Um, and, and my mom and I went through some very, very tough experiences together. I had an incredibly uh, abusive, alcoholic, bipolar father. And she saved me and my brothers from that and got us out of there. And we were homeless for a while and we were all separated for a long time, but she knew like, I have to, like, she literally saved our lives. And that, you know, I grew up real fast during that time period. And we've had this blend of like, she's my mom, but she's also like such a good friend to me as well. And, you know, we've gone through so much together, which is a blessing, but it also puts so much weight on that, on that 
connection that I have like two parents worth of relationships in this one woman. And we've gone through so much together that the inevitability of her death was such like a prolonged, like every funeral I ever went to, I was like, that's going to be my mom one day. Like I just, and I couldn't, that thought was so pervasive that I couldn't get away from it. And I explained this to Sahaj um, and he really helped me write music around that. It's not my process. I usually like write music, just whatever flows out of me. And then go back from a lyrical standpoint and be like, what kind of emotion is elicited by this music? But in this case, I had just really been, and especially coming out of COVID, I was just dealing with like, my, like my mom's going to die. Like she's, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was like compulsive. And he really helped me articulate that feeling as well as focus on like cherishing the time that we have and being grateful for that. And I can't, speaking of being grateful, I cannot say enough thanks to Heidi from Butcher Babies for coming on board. At first, I have to admit I was skeptical because she's such a brutal badass of a performer. I was like, how is this titan Can of translate. metal? Yeah, exactly. And she came in and she gave this unbelievably vulnerable, emotional performance that took this song to exactly to what it needed to be. And again, just like the other collaborators, she's been such an active participant in the creative process, in promoting it. She'll just like randomly send me a text message and just be like, hey, I woke up and the song was in my head. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this. I'm like, that means everything to me, dude. Like, it's so, so cool. But anyways, I'm just going to keep doing this stuff. And if other people connect with it, amazing. Like, if this helps someone else grieve the loss of their parents, that's amazing for me. Even if I don't ever make a dollar off of it. Like, it's way more important for me to, like, create something that other people can emotionally connect with. I'm, I'm sure they will. And that that's a beautiful thing. And that that... Yeah, that means a lot. I mean, Thank it means you. a lot. Thank so you. I have my mom, but that that's just, I don't know, man. That's well, deep. it means a lot for you to, to have me on the show, man. It, it really, um, it feels good to, I don't know, it, it's, it feels kind of weird to keep kicking that dead horse, but like, it means a lot to no. me to be on here talking to you after watching so many of your episodes. And I, I really have felt for a long time that you and I are on a parallel path of like, we're both kind of grassrootsing it. We were both huge music yeah. fans and we're, we're kind of expressing that in our own ways, but without a huge support network and a full team behind us. And um, yeah, man, I just have a lot of respect for what you're doing. But and that, I appreciate you having me be a part of that. Thank you. And and same to you, man. I, I'm, that means a lot to me that you, you have a lot of respect for me because I, I, I love what you're doing and it's very impressive and motivating just hearing you. I'm like, God, I need to, I need to do more. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing plenty, man. I promise. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I appreciate being on the show, Dave. Let's keep in touch, man. I'd love to have Let's you back that, on, maybe co-host or something. I, dude, I would love that. I would love to be a part of one of your conversations with other artists, man. Like, I, I truly enjoy just connecting with really passionate people who have interesting stories who are a part of the world that you and I love so much. So, yeah, man. Yeah, you're a great communicator. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank man. you, dude. I appreciate it. All right, it, brother. All right, dude. Stay in touch. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you so much, Dave. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's this has been it's been great.